Welcome back, AP. Uh, man, it is echoey in here. I'm currently like in 103, and the acoustics in here are ridiculous. So it probably sounds a lot louder on there than it actually is, but it's not, all right? Now, really, really quick, we left off here in class, right? So I'm keeping this thing under 10 minutes, and I want to try to get to the end of the Portuguese, right? So really fast, though, the Portuguese, uh, or excuse me, the Europeans in general, they're going to actually use three big technological, well, two big technological items and one other one, right? Uh, to try and actually make it so they can travel the seas much easier. Now, the big one was the caravel, right? Really quick, something I didn't say in class. Yes, they're big, large, square sails that help out to catch wind. Yes, they have triangular sails so they can actually tack against the wind in those like weird little diagonal shapes that I showed you. Um, the other big thing, though, that I didn't get to is they're much smaller than a galley, right? So they're a smaller boat, and they only take a small crew to actually man them. So that's very, very important. And then you have the fly compass right here. Not fly as in it's pretty cool, but fly as in the fact that it actually rotates around and gives you a degree reading of your bearing on the earth, right? You're heading north, southeast, west, whatever. So the big thing is that the Chinese had actually invented the fly compass first, but it had no degree markers on it, so it was kind of very rudimentary. And the one other item was the astrolabe. Now, the astrolabe actually uses stars to try and try, like to plot your, a, excuse me, whoa, 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 what's going on here? To try and plot an explorer's, there you go, tries to plot an explorer's location and degrees above the equator using the pole star, which is, of course, the north star, right? Now, the thing about it is, though, that they didn't really know how far they were from the equator at the time because they didn't have properly delineated maps of longitude and latitude on them. So they were like, what's the equator, right? So, but anyway, really quick. Everyone is also getting rid of this old misconception that everybody thought the Earth was flat because it's round. Uh, because the world has been round since 150 AD, right? So Ptolemy, an ancient Greek philosopher, actually, like, and scientist, knew for a fact that the world was actually round since 150 AD, right? And a lot of versions of his maps were actually used to try and make it exploration much easier. So everyone was well aware that the Earth was round, right? Now, continuing forward, though. And other people had, remember, started the Genoese, right? Genoa actually sent some excursions out to try and explore the Atlantic a little bit, but they failed, and a lot of them were lost. Then we had another problem. So remember, Marco Polo during the Middle Ages, ventures from Venice through Mongolia down to China, trying to find easier trade routes between the Chinese and the Europeans. He had to travel through Mongolian uh through Mongolian Russia and all through the way through the Mongolian Empire. But now we have a problem. The Mongols just went Islam. And how do you think every single Christian navigator felt about that entire shift? They were just like, like they were so upset about it, right? Extremely upset because now their one route to try and get to Southeast Asia to create these trade lines is now gone, right? So that's why... Also, Ottomans began to take power as the trading rulers, right? Because they were now the Muslim middlemen. Now, every European, after the Mongolians go, Islam is now dependent on Muslim middlemen to get goods from Southeast Asia and move them to Europe. Europe is now, write this down really quick, Europe is now religiously isolated from, religiously and geographically isolated from trade goods in Asia, right? So, really quick, they also just didn't know enough about the world. They thought these are some of the earliest world maps, right? And guess what is considered the center? Jerusalem, right? They believed that Jerusalem was the center of the world and everything else emanated out of it, but a lot of that is due to religious bias, right? Also, that's the world map at the time. And down here, this is called the Nuremberg Globe, right? This thing was actually created and made in 1492, the same exact year that Columbus decides, well, hey, if I sail this way, Asia will be on the backside, right? So everyone was well aware that the Earth was round, right? So everyone was well aware that the Earth was round long before he ever even actually ventured in that direction, okay? So here's the thing they have the problem with the most, though. It's that, number one, the seas are dangerous, right? So the caravel is going to help them navigate them much easier. Uh, compasses are going to help them get there much easier. Large map tables and map rooms and cartographers are going to make, help make accurate world maps. Well, the issue being is that sea voyages are very dangerous. You have to staff an entire crew, right? Which, granted, finding crewmen was not hard, right? Because it was guaranteed money. 
but the bigger issue in lies the fact the way the winds actually move, right? So these are called trade winds for a reason, trade winds. They were called trade winds ever since they actually used the Indian Ocean to move products through this entire little monsoon marketplace, right? But trade winds used to be used at the time to try and find ways to or from different areas, right? So from Portugal, you could actually follow trade winds all the way to the Caribbean and then go northbound and end up coming back in around northern Spain or France coming back. These are what world winds look like. Well, the thing about it is they're going to create, they're going to, the Portuguese realize that they're going to have to go all the way around Africa. Now going back really quick to this wind map, looking at this wind map, what's the one issue that you take when you try to go around Africa from Portugal? That's exactly right there, Laura. You have to end up going in that diagonal shape and you have to end up going in pit stops all the way around Africa because you're constantly sailing against the wind. And for hundreds of years, the Europeans could never even actually have the ability to sail against the wind until the caravel came along. So that was a major, major invention. But what they're going to do, which is actually really genius, the Portuguese are going to create trade posts, forts, and even plantations of sugar all the way around the coast of Africa. Okay, big items early on that they're actually going to encounter as well whenever they're creating these trade markets around Africa, gold and slaves, right? Around 1440 is when African slaves begin to show up on the Iberian Peninsula, right? Because most of your slaves beforehand actually usually ended up coming from areas like the Black Sea, right? Which we'll talk about here in a second. Now, anyway, the motivations behind exploration and cultivation of new trade routes is, of course, the old adage that you learned when you were in freshman year, gold, God, and glory, right? Well, the reason why I have God in all caps has to do with the fact that, anyway, there we go, uh, it has to do with the fact that um, the God one I put in all caps because, remember how I told you they were looking constantly for those lost, remember O'Toole, right? We talked about they were looking for those lost communities of Christians, right, that were just all over the world. The God motivation was some of the Europeans on these explorations were actually looking for those lost communities so they could basically find reinforcements to fight the Muslim threat that actually barred them from Southeast Asia, right? So to use them as a military advantage. Gold, of course, is the expanse of money and trying to push that. And glory in the sense of trying to actually find something undiscovered and also trying to be able to, like, basically pull down a larger military empire, right? So... Henry the Navigator is going to be the very first Portuguese person to really get in on the game. I'm trying to keep an eye on my time. Uh, big, big, get big on the game. He wants to actually, he's the Prince of Portugal, right? Father of, I think it's John the First. I'll look it up. So anyway, Henry the Navigator, though, very well known. He wants to increase, increase Portugal's commercial holdings, right? He actually said that he was looking for the River of Gold, right, below the Sahara. He thought somewhere in Africa you might actually be able to find just large amounts of actual physical gold because the Malian Empire had actually sat on top of it for like hundreds of years. Then he's going to start realizing too that there's also these tons of these little islands that were actually uninhabited. Put a star next to the Azori Islands because it's very, very important. The Portuguese end up discovering the Azori Islands because on these voyages, which are uninhabited islands off the coast of Africa, right? So, and go ahead and start jotting this down, okay? But also what's going to end up happening when they start discovering these islands, they start setting up colonies on top of them, right? And out of these colonies, slavery and sugar begins to take hold as a big part of the Portuguese economy, okay? So let me see if I can zoom out just a touch. There we go. There you go. So slavery and sugar becomes huge by the Portuguese, right? Slavery pivots from being usually Black Sea um, residents in Eastern Europe to a largely African base, right? And a lot of that is due to the fact that the Africans, they had access to them. And also a lot of these larger African kingdoms, like the Malian Empire, as well as the coast of Ghana, were actually selling these slaves to these Europeans as they begin to create these trade ports all the way around Africa, right? So, and I'll show you a map of that tomorrow. Don't let me forget. It makes it make a lot more sense. But the Portuguese are also going to seek out to make even more money, even though they're making a ton of money off of their slavery and sugar plantation ideas, right? The issues that they have are winds, hurricanes, and storms, right? Trying to get around Africa was very difficult, but Bartholomew Diaz is going to be the very first one to do it. He's going to navigate all the way around what was called the Cape of Storms, right, originally, but it's going to be renamed the Cape of Good Hope. Very nice, Jules. Very impressed. I know I've said your name like 18 times. Fine. Very nice job, Jillian or Michaela or Mala or any of you guys, right? Now, first open the door to India. 
and I've got about 10 seconds left, but Vasco da Gama is gonna be the first person to try and go all the way there and all the way back, right? First to try and make a trip there and back, he had four boats and 170 men, and when he actually made it back from his first voyage, the spices sold for a boatload. Get it? <laughs> all right, we'll talk more tomorrow in class, all right? Y'all have a good one.